All right, welcome everybody to another Monday Expert Interview. Today we have two amazing guests on, Greg Ugaldi, the immediate past chairman of NAHB, and Mark Purcell from the National Housing Endowment will be joining us to talk about all the great things that we do on Dave Cooper. Dot live. So with that said, I'm just going to jump into it this morning with Greg Ugaldi. we got a lot to cover. Workforce development, workforce development, let me say it one more time, workforce development is a much needed thing that we need in this space right now. And I think when you start hearing the numbers of the shortages and where we are today, it'll blow your socks off. So with that said, Mr. Greg Ugaldi, how are you today? Good. How are you? How are Man, you? It's I'm, always I'm, good to be back, Dave. It is. Well, it's great to have you back. I'm I'm doing great. I'm you know I'm in Montana. It's going to be really hot. There's a heat wave coming across, like 110 degrees. So I'll let you know how I'm doing after the show if I'm not <laughs> sweating to death in here. But uh, Greg, you've had a lot of things happening since the last time we had you on the show. Uh, you come on the show regularly to give us updates at from the NAHB, and you've been also bringing in other guests that are associations of the NAHB or part of the NAHB or past chairs of the NAHB. And the reason for all of this is we need to collaborate and we need to all work together to bring more people into our industry uh, and to help resolve issues that we have in our industry like lumber and other things as well. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what's been going on in your world? Sure. So you hit a lot of it on the head. You know, we'll talk as the, as the show goes on, we'll talk a little bit more about the supply chain issues, right? And the, the lumber prices are front and center on that and what we're doing about it. So, you know, I'll just mention right up front that uh, work with uh, Commerce Secretary Raimondo is uh, she's promised a convening that, that we're going to call it, you know, it, it's funny because uh, as we put together the list of those people that are going to be involved, a summit is kind of old school. Now we're all the way up to a convening. But really what that's about is addressing uh, supply chain issues as we move forward, looking for more uh, permanent type fixes rather than just quick adjustments here and there. So much more to follow on that. But today, yep. as you said, Dave, we, we really need to look at this workforce development piece. There, So many things are interconnected, but we have somebody with us today, right? So, so you know how I always bring in like a, a special guest to really help us make the points and, and hammer home some of the information that we need. So Mark Purcell, who's the chief executive officer at our National Housing Endowment is chock full of information. I mean, you know, and the timing is perfect. We keep hearing the administration, they're talking about the American Jobs Plan, right? And how that relates. There's a lot of labor issues there and possible unionization and different things that, that we're going to have some headwinds on. But the bottom line is it's increasing the workforce to try to fill those 350 to 400,000 job openings we have in our industry. Those are the numbers that you were talking about. Right. How do we get started on that? Where do we go? So that's, that's what we have in store, Dave. And I think, you know, you have a lot of people in your audience that watch this, the labor issues and workforce mm -hmm. development very closely. Yeah, well, they do. Listen, even in manufacturing offsite, uh, you know, the, the, the labor pool is not there, whether you're building in the field or you're building in manufacturing. You know, so I think this is such a hot topic on what are we doing as an industry to say, hey, we have the coolest industry out there. We have every job that every other industry has. Swinging a hammer is the coolest thing in the world because you can do that, make a ton of money and have no student debt, right? So right. there's that side right. about it. Uh, and and it's, such a, it's such a desired and needed craft right now to have, you know, MEP, you know, uh, HVAC contractors, mechanical contractors, plumbers, electricians, but you also need the architects and the engineers and the land planners. You need all of these things. And that's a big job that, you know, Mark Purcell's taking a look at all of these different things and doing research on to say, hey, 
you know, how do we get the students back? How do we follow which way the trends are going? Where are the industries going? So this is going to be an interesting conversation. I don't know. Should we bring them in? I, I think we better. I think we better bring them right in. Let's bring them in. Perfect. Hey, Mark, how are you today? Good afternoon, Dave. Good afternoon, Greg. Thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, this is exciting and no no pressure at all. We're not going to dig into all of these things you have to do whatsoever. But uh, out, outside of us not really agreeing on hockey teams, uh, otherwise <laughs> our conversation has been wonderful, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. <laughs> Go Wings. <laughs> Go Wings. Mark, uh, you, you've had a very tenured career in the building industry at the National Association of Home Builders, uh, now at the NA, NHE, National Housing Endowment. Can you take just a few minutes? We want to know everything about you from the moment you were born to this very moment in time. Do not leave out any of the good stuff from the hospital, but you only have two minutes to do it. And if you don't get it right, we're going to be calling your family. In fact, Greg's wife will call your family and find out the <laughs> truth, and then we'll bring her on and have this show. But go ahead. You got two minutes. Show The floor is yours. Well, I was born and raised in the, in the Great Lakes State. As I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a big uh, Detroit Red Wings fan. I, I grew up near Ann Arbor, where I went to uh, university at the University of Michigan. Uh, go Blue. Hopefully, we can get our football team squared away here at some point. Um, but uh, I'm a Michigan guy, born and raised. Then I moved to D.C. in, in uh, 1988 to work for a, a, a German bank doing construction financing overseas. It was my introduction to the uh, – to the uh, uh, construction world and worked on building large operations, processing plants all around the world, doing feasibility studies and progress payments and the whole banking side of it and got to know the construction end of it. Didn't know what a trade association was. Uh, eventually ended up working for AGC, the Associated General Contractors of America that represents the commercial and heavy and the highway guys. I uh, looked in the paper one day. This is back when we read the newspaper on Sundays and the professional opportunities listing was a, a listing for a, a sales and marketing guy who knew construction uh, to help run the International Builder Show at, at the National Association of Home Builders. I took that ad. I showed it to my wife. I knew NHB pretty well. I said, honey, I will get this job if I want to apply for it. It will change our lives and, and certainly did and had a very rewarding run running the International Builder Show for 15 years. Uh, very stressful job, as you can imagine. You've been to the show, uh, putting that thing together is, uh, you know, it's a four day circus. Actually, it's a it's a 10 day circus with all the meetings, and the association events, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, just for my sanity, had to step away. And uh, fortunately, um, the, the, the top position at the National Housing Endowment opened up right at the right time. And, um, and I was glad, glad to take it because I've always been interested in workforce. And now it's great. I, I you know, I, I tell my friends, I, I spend my time with high school kids, college kids, and really rich people will give us a lot of money, do our good work. So it's, 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 it's kind of fun. And, uh, and I'm enjoying it. Uh, I've got the great support of, of Greg and the other NHB senior officers. Couldn't do it without it. And, and the entirety of NHB that we rely on because we're a small organization. We're very efficient with the dollars we get in the, and the dollars we put out. So we've got a small staff, a small operating budget, and, and do some really great work that I'll, I'll be happy to talk about. Yeah, for sure. Why don't, uh, if you could just take a second and just say, you know, what is the role of National Housing Endowment? Just give, what, what is it that everybody could expect that you guys do? Just an overview. Sure. We're a 501c3 tax exempt organization, nonprofit. Uh, in short, our mission is education, training, and research, and we are focused 100% on residential because we're the we we consider ourselves the philanthropic arm of NAHB. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Greg, go ahead. I know you're excited to have this conversation. Yeah, no, this it is it, it's so great because as you can see, and if you picture as we're having this conversation. Remember, so we have the, the National Association of Home Builders, right? We have roughly 125 plus thousand members there. And we have two entities, the Home Builders Institute and the National Housing Endowment. Right. Those two entities are what um, HBI actually creates the curriculum, tries to get it into the school systems and Mark's organization and the hard work that they do 
they, as he said, it's all about finding the funding to get all of these different thoughts and things done. And right at the tip of the spear, all these um, colleges and high schools and just students around the country that are very, as you said, very thirsty to get involved with um, many, many aspects of this in order to train for, for a better way of life as they move into the future. Yeah, for sure. And Mark, you know, I think you're, you got a difficult job when you think about, you know, how do you reach all of these students? How do you do the research study to find out really what these students or younger generation, you know, wants or needs are? And, you know, can you walk us through, like, you have some things that you're working on now. Give us an example of some of the research you've been doing and, 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 and how do we collectively come together as an industry to make it attractive? Well, you know, on the research front, we've got a couple of projects that we that were one we're just getting ready to release, which is a uh, building systems guide for builders. You know, trying to answer the question why aren't more builders uh, building offsite and using modular and panelized and and all the all the offsite um, um, tools that are available? I think the numbers are like four or five percent of builders are using them. Why hasn't that, why isn't that thirty or forty or eighty percent given the given the efficiencies and the quality control. Um, so we're about to release that study. And, and, and the nexus with labor is interesting, especially right now. Um, and we're trying to help builders. What are the questions you need to ask if you want to, want to get into building systems? It turns out one is about transportation. How do you get the, you know, the panels and the, and the systems to the job site? Not as straightforward as one might think, giving all the different uh, road regulations, and you got across counties and different municipalities. That is an issue, uh, but the the one issue that that's a real problem right now is the shortage of labor. A lot of builders use uh, subcontract their framing work. The framing companies have they know that they know there's a shortage. They know they're in demand. Um, they are not passing. On, they are not willing to pass on the efficiencies of offsite construction versus stick built framing because they don't have to because builders need the framers and are gonna pay the framers what the framers need to be paid. The markets, uh, the shortage uh, of labor has, has really perverted the market and, and, and is a barrier right now to uh, increasing building systems. And, and that comes out in the study. Yeah, for sure. And that, that study's coming out uh, soon, correct? Correct. And uh, we'll make that available uh, through NHB, through the NHB Building Systems Council that I know you're very involved in and, and get that out at no cost to, to all the builders that are members of the association. For sure. And, Go ahead. So no, you know, one of the similarities, Mark, that they can't be overlooked either is when we look at this whole lumber demand issue, when we look now, we have not brought products along enough to substitute for lumber demand, right? So so here we are. Yeah, we, we have um, ICFs, right? Insulated concrete forms, some, some different thoughts into the future, but they're not ready right now. So what does that mean? That means the same thing. You have demand for labor, you have demand for these products. What happens when you increase demand? Up go the prices and scarcity is a, is a big deal. And so we're seeing that across the board, but with labor, sometimes it, it's often overlooked the impact that you just, you just described, for example, and how severely that affects a lot of these barriers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, and just like the shortages that all industries, you know, automotive, appliances, um, you name it, sporting goods, boating, fishing, golf equipment, et cetera, huge backlogs, huge back orders. You know, let's hope this all washes out quickly as people get back to work and supply mm -hmm. chains are, are normalized. I, you know, I don't know, um, but it's it, it's a tough time right now. And let's hope uh, in a few months uh, we can get back to normal pricing, normal supply and demand equilibriums. Um, and, and we, and, you know, certainly in the building products area. Sure. So who, who currently right now, Mark, from an educational standpoint, are we teaching students about offsite construction? Are we are we teaching students or, or, or have programs out there that that keep the students, you know, at a level where they're coming out of school or coming out of trade school, that they understand what the latest and greatest technology is to interest them in staying in the business? 
Well, our flagship program is our HELP program, the Home Building Education Leadership Program uh, that we've had um, has been operating since the late 80s. Uh, we're in yeah. 43 university and two-year schools right now. We're about to add five more, Middle Tennessee State, Tarleton State University, University of Cincinnati, uh, UMass Amherst, and, and University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, we're going through the final review phase right now with our committee and our trustees will we'll approve or not approve those for, for funding, but we'll be close to 50 schools here shortly. Wow. And I do see a lot of modular and offsite construction being taught uh, at the university level. Our program, we come in and fund faculty, residential faculty, residential curriculum. You have to understand at the, at, the, at the college level, the commercial and heavy industries have done a great job of funding programs. They tend to have bigger companies and greater concentration of capital. So it's easier for them to get organized and to fund programs and they've been doing it for a long time. So these kids that come in to a construction management program that maybe wanna build homes, there's no curriculum, there's no faculty. Right. They end up going into commercial and heavy. In yeah. the programs, in the schools where we've come in and funded, uh, again, the, the faculty and the curriculum, two thirds of the kids end up in residential. Turns out they wanna build homes and communities. The great thing is uh, uh, 10 years after their after they graduate, 40% uh, of them own their own companies or are executives with large home building companies. So they're doing very well and making an impact in the industry. But a lot of the a lot of the curriculum, and I certainly see it at the graduate level, we under offer a number of scholarships, uh, include uh, modular and offsite construction. So they're getting exposed to it. And, and these are the kids that become, you know, out of school, they become project manager, supervisors, uh, superintendents. You know, and then 10 years later, they're graduating into the executive ranks or starting their own business. So they're getting exposed to it at the college level. I can't say that necessarily at the skilled trades level. Right. Well, and one of the things that we've been finding as we've been traveling across the country and we're live streaming into a lot of the same universities, you know, with NAHB student chapter, we've done several shows and we've been getting feedback from the students. And the interesting part is, you know, what we think uh, is old hat, so to speak reading the comments, uh, you know, this is new to them. And it will never be ahead of the curve with a lot of the students, but, you know, it's going to such a level now that, you know, the commercial space, for instance, you keep talking about, right, where a lot of these students end up, they have the cool technology, they have BIM and, yeah. you know, all the 3D and digital twins and parametric and geometric. Now that's coming into the residential space. And I see that as a huge opportunity to showcase that for all of these students to say, hey, Here's another world where they care about the environment. They can come in and actually be part of solving one of the biggest problems our nation's ever faced, and that's the housing crisis. Yeah, yeah, we're seeing a lot of um, climate um, uh, programs at the college level because that's certainly an issue. Sustainable construction. Uh, a lot of the schools are also focused on um, uh, building um, hurricane resistance and flood resistant homes. Certainly that's in the news right now with what's going on in Miami and what's happening to that coastline. Yeah. Um, and so I was just up at the University of Pennsylvania and a lot of their graduate students are doing research in that area, sharing it with the undergrad students so they all understand they're going into a marketplace that's, that has, has other concerns on top of uh, affordable and available housing uh, than builders had 10 years ago, certainly. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, listen, everybody, if you are just joining us, we are live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Greg Ugaldi, why are we live on Twitch? Because that's where the young folks are, Dave. Yeah, not just the young. Greg Ugaldi's on Twitch every week I as well. Too. You know, it's a great well, wait platform a to watch. Wait, I thought I was young, no? Yeah, you're, you're, you're right, I guess. You're, 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 you're younger than most people, for sure. You're younger <laughs> than me, and that's a plus. Yeah, for sure. But we are on Twitch. So listen, if you could right now, please like and share. And if you are not following the National Housing Endowment, I highly suggest you do. They're always looking for research projects and people to collaborate and, and getting information. This is a good way to, to, to start your journey in our industry if you're not already. And also to the audience, we need you to ask questions. And I got a question for the audience and Mark, you may or may not like this, but I think we should ask all those who follow us and leaders in the offsite space, who wants to go around and speak at these schools and talk to these students? 
we need the leaders of the industry to come together and say, hey, why don't we grassroots this in each of our communities, they could all go to the local trade school, local colleges. And I think the professors and universities that are watching this now should take advantage of that as well, because everybody's so willing to share. Mm -hmm. And we do, we have great luck with that. That's a great point, Dave, is yeah. that, you know, one of the things that our local and state associations do so well is to take that step into the communities. You know, where you find it too is where we have old shop programs. Remember when we were in school? You had okay. shop class and you had, uh, and, and so what's happening, there's a lot of revitalization going on, retooling of some of those. You know, now you're using like a lot of the latest technology. But, you know, one of the questions I had from Mark, Dave, that you and I always talk about this too. Yeah. If you looked at the growth potential to get into this residential side, with workforce development. Mark, where do you see, what, what is a realist? Are we looking at the potential to, to grow it up to 10, 15, 20%? I mean, that seems just so in reach with all the benefits. Oh, I think it, I think it's certainly in reach. And, you know, you talked about shop classes and that's kind of a a big issue for me because, you know, when I went to school, you know, I had wood shop, uh, machine right. shop. I took welding. We had auto body. We had a class that built a home every year and sold it. And, uh, you know, we had all that stuff and that's all gone now. Uh, so it's up to us as industry to come in and support yeah. uh, workforce training in the residential space. I'm, I'm happy to announce um, we just closed a deal with the Home Builders Institute, which is our training partner. We don't offer direct training. We fund it. And uh, uh, we, we've just opened up in 29 new high schools across the country, thanks to a, a generous grant from the Truist Foundation. And uh, that'll train 2,400 kids. And so we're doing this at chunks at a time. We're now in yeah. over 80 high schools across the country. I think HBI itself is in about 250, a long way to go. Um, uh, but the good news is, um, we started something called the Skilled Labor Fund at the endowment um, to address a skilled labor issue uh, four years ago. And when we first started talking to high schools and even middle schools about skilled labor, uh, we were not welcomed. Um, the principals, the guidance counselor, the school board, uh, encouraged by the parents and the students themselves, were all judged and paid based upon how many kids got into a four-year school. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to report that's changed. For, for some good reasons and some not so good reasons. Not so good reasons, student debt has become a national issue. It's talked about politically in the national level all the time. You know, I like to say uh, art history is great, but I'll pay a plumber. And, uh, um, you know, kids coming out of school with, you know, you hear these numbers, 100, 200, $250,000, and, you know, they can't get a job for $45,000. They're in a big hole right from the get go. I don't think anybody wants them there. And the trades are an option. So now we're being welcomed. Uh, people want to hear about the programs. They want to start programs. Um, there's bureaucracy involved. HBI has been great at helping us get through the school board systems. In some states, it's a we just got a, we just got their curriculum approved in the state of Ohio, for instance. That was a, a, a state school board decision. In other states, it's a district by district yeah. decision. Uh, and that process now is, is, is going better than it was before. So there's the environment is better, Greg. Um, so I, I think 10, 15 percent is conservative. Uh, I think there's demand. Um, another another factor was uh, construction was considered an essential industry during the pandemic. Yes. I mean, yeah. what else advertises you'll have a job if there's 350,000 to 400,000 openings today? That number is going to go up because the average skilled worker is, what, 57 or 58, my age. Uh, they're looking at retirement in the next five, 10 years, uh, certainly. Um, and so there's going to be more openings. Um, our government recognizes it's an essential industry. Uh, the demand for housing is, you know, it, is there. And it's going to be there for a long time because of, you know, the, the echo from 08 and 09 and the housing crisis uh, and, you know, just the demographics of housing formation. So, it's a great career, not just to go in and, and make a great paycheck. You can do that. Uh, but if you've got some entrepreneurial uh, spirit, uh, there's low barriers to entry. And uh, I like to tell the story of my uh, my neighbor who started as an HVAC technician, 
He's now got 55 trucks and he's a two handicap at golf. So I don't think he's spending a lot of time with compressors. Um, but he started as a, as a technician and, and started his own business. And the skilled trades allow you to do that um, with, with, with low barriers to entry as compared to other businesses. So great opportunities and great demand. Yeah, there, yeah they, there is a lot of opportunity. Are you finding resistance from any parents as you're out there? Or are you finding parents to be more supportive now of uh, their children going to trade school versus going to college? Um, some of the meetings I've been at, um, you know, there, there's some parents, you know, when you stand around at a cocktail party or wherever, a reception or something, everyone's, oh, my son's going to, uh, to BU or BC or University right. of Michigan or wherever. And that's what they want to talk about. I'm, I'm starting to hear more people say, you know, my son's uh, got, I've got a neighbor. He's real proud of his son's getting his uh, journeyman education with the IBEW as an electrician, getting paid great money, learning some great skills. And his goal is to start his own business. And uh, he's going to be able to do that because the education he's getting uh, and certainly the kids that are in our, our programs with the Home Builders Institute uh, feel the same way. So I think parents are opening up to it. Um, you know, the numbers on kids that are failing out of school because they're forced into a four year degree yeah. program and they're just yeah. not met. It's not right for them. Uh, they want to work with their hands. They want to work outside. They want to interact with people. Um, they want to challenge. They want physical work. Uh, the trades offer that with, with great paychecks. Um, and uh, they don't want to spend another four years in the classroom. Um, so sure. I, I think it's opening up. I haven't done any survey or research work. That's a, that's a good topic, Dave, um, right. to, to get the, the attitudes of parents because they're so influential. But uh, we're hearing it from guidance counselors and school principals yeah. and school boards, certainly. And one of the things, too, when we look at, uh, you know, it'd be actually remiss, we did talk a little bit about the, the student competition that you implemented a while ago, Mark, at IBS, and that we've been able to really continue and develop on so so that now it's both at the high school and college level but to me that shows that parents as well as students are really starting to get this they're really starting to get invested in the opportunities here for those exact reasons that you just expounded upon because you see here that and it's all great schools i mean four-year great educations or some of them, you know, you might start with a, an associate's degree, two years. Mm -hmm. You might come right out of high school and then supplement it as you go. Control your debt, maybe buy a house and a truck, show up at your class reunions in a much better financial position than your, sure. your classmates, right? right? So when we see the energy in that room, you know, it's 900 kids jumping and pounding and just happy with the awards that they're receiving, and being able to take it into that education piece as well as into a career, which people were, you know, yeah. sitting around the kitchen table. It was a lot more difficult to talk about just a few years ago. We got away from all of this and now we're starting to get back to it. But it can't be lost on everybody how important that is that we work at that bridging that knowledge gap in that acceptance gap with the guidance counselors and everybody in the high schools all the way up through the colleges around the country and i think we're starting to see that you make you, know, you make a good go ahead mark i'm sorry go uh, ahead um greg you talk about the student the student competition and and if you come to the international builder show at design and construction week that's co-located with the kitchen and bath sh industry show uh, I'll be in Orlando this year in February. Look up the student competition award ceremony. Yep. And if you yep. want to be motivated about what you do for a living in housing and about getting kids involved, if you have any question about the next generation of kids and their energy for the industry, when you walk in that room, <laughs> you, you will be happy you're a builder, that you're a houser, and you will believe that the next generation is going to do wonderful things because Greg's right. There are 900 kids in that room singing their school fight songs, and they have worked really hard on these student competitions. And it's a cool deal. They, we, they actually look at a real piece of dirt. They're all looking at the same project, and they've got to go through regulatory, financing, tax issues, permitting, before they even get to the design of the community, the building of the house, yep. the technology in the homes, 
uh, pricing, marketing, civil works, they've got to go soup the nuts. So they get a sense of, hey, a builder just doesn't uh, uh, swing a hammer. There's a lot more to it. Yes. And, uh, and, and these kids are great. Um, uh, we're real happy to be able to um, uh, sponsor 500 of those kids to, to help them yeah. defray their, their travel costs. Right. As a matter of fact, uh, Herb Kohler set up a, a Herb Kohler a scholarship fund to help us out with that so we can do even more going forward. Um, so we're real pleased with that. And uh, it's, it's heartwarming and motivating uh, to get right. in that room. And, and Greg's been kind enough to MC that a few times. And I know he comes out of that room better than we than we walked in. That's right. Hey, well, Greg, Greg, you're you're a great speaker for one, and 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 you know, just like yourself, Mark. Greg's been in this industry. Greg has a building, uh, you know, company that that he's part of as well. So th these aren't just people sitting at the right. NAAP who don't belong in the building world. You are in the building world, and the same codes that affect. The small builders affect the big builders and affect also people that are serving at the NEHB. So this all comes from the heart and everybody else out there that, you know, that has a company or owns a company. Uh, we all have the same issues and that's what you guys are really great at. And we're going to go to comments here with the audience in one second. But first, you know, one of the major things I want everybody to, to take away from this conversation is we spend a lot of time talking about the universities and we have the university professors on. Eric Holt will be on the show again coming up in a couple of weeks. And every week, Eric's helping every month. Eric's helping me co-host three more university professors on the show to talk about their programs. But what's really important is the universities are working with their communities. They're working with the grade school level, the high school level, the trade school level, because the universities also know not everybody is university bound and mm -hmm. their students cannot be successful, cannot be successful without the boots on the ground working together with them. And I think this is a part of the conversation I want to be very clear. This isn't just about kids going to become right. engineers and architects. They understood the universities understand the need for all the mechanical trades and everything else. And it's right. uh, We'll get into we'll get into that a little bit, Mark uh, and Greg, after we do a few comments. But first, Good. why don't we take a moment and say hello to who's out there and, and sure. I'm sure there's some characters. Always is. Ah, Jamie Milan. What's happening, Jamie from Sukup? Uh, good morning from Vancouver, British Columbia. Now, I just to leave Jamie there for a second. So this is a young guy that I met a few years ago at the Industrial Wood Base Conference. Uh, you know, out of school and is already making a big name for himself. And, and he's a real he's a real influencer when it comes to the younger people. So, Jamie, it's always great to see you. And, and Sue Cup, uh, Sue Cup's always been a been a huge supporter of our show. So good to see you. Oh, Andrew Wilkinson from the United Kingdom. Good evening, Dave, Jen and Greg. Andrew, thank you for joining us today. Andrew Seely from G Pods America. Great topic and guests. So many labor challenges to work out. If we will need, we will indeed meet the future with full strength. Hey, I like that. I'll show you some muscle there, Andrew. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. Which one of us was that with the with the guns there? See it? That's <laughs> that, that, good. Listen, that that that's hundred percent you, Greg. We'll we'll have we'll have, we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a gun show after the show. We'll, we'll, <laughs> all right, it's a it's a PG show. Dwayne C. Barney. My experience has been that commercial construction has long-term executive potential. Other than track builders, the only growth on the residential side is owning your own business. Many who take this route fail lacking business skills. It is difficult to move up with a small builder or remodeler. They go commercial where growth and benefits are available. Now, Dwayne, this is a good, good topic. And, yeah. and, and I'll put this back to you, Mark, because with your programs, and we can take that off the screen for a second. With your programs, can are there's a, there's there's teaching a trade, and then there's teaching how to be a good business person in the trade. Uh -huh. How do we teach the younger generation not only to learn the trade, but have enough business sense yeah. that they can either go out on their own or move up in the ranks at another builder, so they come out with that mentality of I'm just not here for a seven to three job. Sure. Well, part of the HBI curriculum includes some basic business skills, how to read an income statement, a balance sheet, um, and and certainly at the um, at the two year and four year um, college level, um, where the kids are getting construction management degrees, um, the the business uh, programs are available to the kids to select as a, as a minor. 
Uh, and a lot of them do because they realize they want to go in and, and start their own business. So your, your guest is right. Uh, if you don't have some education and some training and a mentor or a path within your company, uh, then you're going to fail. I, I will say that, you know, 30 percent of the homes in the United States are built by large production builders that are actively hiring today and are looking for young people to come into their into their shops and, and they offer, um, they certainly offer uh, an upward uh, mobility path. Uh, so those are available. And frankly, um, um, they do a very good job at, re I, we talked a little bit earlier about our um, 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 student competition. As part of that, we offer an onsite uh, job fair and that's dominated by, by large production builders that offer the kind of big company experience that some people are looking for but, uh, you know, the home building industry, the big guys build 30 percent of the homes. That means 70 percent of the homes are built by small and medium sized businesses that are started by entrepreneurs and small business people uh, that, that get the training and education uh, that they need to not only build and construct and develop land, but also um, to run a business. Well, and that's what's great about this country because 70% of all businesses, I don't know the exact number, are small businesses in general. So we're not we're not in a fishbowl by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? Our widget's just a different widget. So uh, perfect, perfect. Thanks, Dwayne. Next comment, please. Buzz Hollitzer, what's happening? Be like Mike Rowe. You know, there you go. So Mike was the keynote for IBS this past year. And you're right. Here's somebody out there showing the world that dirty jobs are cool and there's people that want to do it and they're making a ton of money doing it and having fun. Yep. Perfect. Thanks, Buzz. Henry Mickelberg from France in the house. Isn't the current shortage of labor and materials just a measure of the capitalist profit driven <laughs> success paradigm that is the American dream? It'll never be fixed until become comrades. <laughs> All right, who hey, wants to answer for that one? Henry, good luck buying that affordable home in France. Have fun with that. Yeah. <laughs> but, he, you know, it's, he, he's actually raising some decent points there, yeah. right? Because, you know, look what the administration currently is trying to do, right? They, they, they see that there's a need going forward for – uh, affordable homes being built. We focus on housing affordability more than just creating uh, public influenced homes to drive that price down through controlled labor through, as he alludes to, you know, you start getting into too much government involvement pretty right. quickly if you're not careful. So really our job is to create the American dream to be spearheaded by the entrepreneurial spirit and be able to allow profit making smaller builders, which are the backbone of the country, right creating the American dream. But, you know, a lot of times you have that conflict where it is funding from the government in whatever way it is, whether it's through materials, but especially through labor, you can really yeah. control costs, but you drive up costs in different ways by doing that. That's the battle that we fight every day for our industry and for our mom and pop builders and our small, medium, and some large builders as well. We fight that battle every day. Yeah, and, and Henry, Henry's, Henry's in this industry pretty deep and he does, yes. he likes the yes. snarky, you know, comments and, and, but I mean, he does it. He's for, a good he, commenter. He wants people That's to right. think about it and be thought provoking. Exactly. And sure. I will say, um, you know, when, when you look at some of the comments that Henry makes and what he's doing in the industry, these are hard questions. These are what people think. And sometimes we need to, we need to discuss it and put it on the, put it on That's the, what he was doing. That's what yep. he was doing. He was, All right, Henry, I, I appreciate you. It's almost bedtime over there, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Next comment. Hey, Jerry McCahey from Integra's in the house. Always a pleasure, Jerry. We are running our own third level educational institutions to train both young people and more mature people to enter the offsite industry. 
Yeah, very, very, oh, very, holy cow, you're writing a book today, Jerry. Hey. If your current building process is labor constrained and has been for years and you can't change the constraints, then you need to change your building process, just like other industrialized economies have done. Remember, YS has declining construction productivity over the last 40 years. Even if you could get mute more people uh, to enter the industry, there needs to be a focus on productivity in order to improve affordability and throwing people at the problem respectfully is not the solution with there's more. I think we'll go with that. I, I will. Well, but you see where he's going with that. And he's right. Yeah. Because and that's why uh, Mark, he and I have been on panels together, too. And he recognizes that there's there's some very common threads through all of these links. One of them is that, that the facts are that we have to address all of these prongs the best that we can. But yeah. it's not that there's a simple or a, a silver bullet fix for any of them. And okay. which means exactly what he was just saying is that, you know, you're still going to have labor that you have to focus on one way or another. You got to close that gap And the affordability comes in. And that's what he stands by is that you create the systems and the process and the the, the science behind using the best possible uh, mechanics, the best possible methods, as well as the best possible workforce, robotic, uh, scientific, whatever it is, plus human capital to try to control all of these variables the best you, that, that you can and mm -hmm. provide housing around the world for yeah. uh, people that can, uh, you know, to be able to afford and be protected. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of work to be done in productivity, and certainly offsite is is a big key to that. Uh, you still need people. Uh, there's still a huge shortage. Uh, but he's right, just throwing bodies at an industry that hasn't changed its methods in in decades or longer, a hundred years. Um, it's over a hundred years. Uh, industry's got a long way to go, and uh, uh, that's mm -hmm. why we funded the uh, the offsite uh, a study, and we look forward to releasing that soon. We'd like to see more builders uh, engage in it, and uh, uh, Change doesn't come easy, but it, it's needed. So I, I agree with right. his comments. All right. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate you. Uh, next comment, please. Peter Molinar. Question. Peter follows directions. I didn't say it today, but if you do have a question to make it easier, put a Q in front of it. Uh, do you suggest any jobs that are involved in high performance buildings to achieve the passive house standard? Designers, verifiers, ear sealing specialists, uh, product specialists. Well, certainly on the on the engineering and designing end, um, there's a lot of work to be done. There's some great companies that are involved in that area. I have noticed um, a, a lot of our university programs are really focused on airflow and air sealing, um, and there's been a lot of great research that come out on that. Um, uh, university of Pennsylvania has got a great uh, housing research center, and they've published some great information uh, recently about um, air sealing uh, issues. Um, and, and, and how to solve those. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity and, uh, um, but certainly on the, on the, on the engineering design side, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Great. Great. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for the comments and questions. We're going to get back to our conversation and we'll get back to you right at the end of the show here. So if you do have a question, uh, please put a cue in front of it. I know there's banter going back and forth in the, in the audience. So but let's get back to uh, Mark. All the all the things that you guys are working on and what we have coming up. And 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 just one other comment too, because I made a mental note with with the IBS and the student, you know, and the students that show up. If I recall last year in Vegas, those students were center stage as you walked in the front door. I think yes, that yes. they held their whole right. That that's how much of a focus that I uh, that NAHB is putting on. Uh, you know, helping bring younger people into our industry and the education that goes behind it. And they do deserve the spotlight. That's right. They, they do. And, and you know, we've been talking about the university and college programs. And, you know, when we fund those programs, there's got to be a tie to industry, a tie to the local association mm -hmm. uh, for all the reasons that we talked about, uh, for people to come in as speakers, for job site visits, but also for placement at the end of the pipeline. There's got to be that tie. But, uh, you know, when we look at skilled labor, uh, we've really driven down into the high school and the middle school levels. And I think we are the largest national sponsor of um, skilled residential skilled trades career fairs. We call, them, we call it our Career Connections Program. And every year we've sponsored, the last three years, 
Uh, we have sponsored 90 career fairs across the country, again, organized by a local association in partnership with a local school district or, or one school or a group of schools. And we've put about 10,000 kids each year through these programs. And they're one or two day events um, where the kids come and you think of a career fair, you think of a hotel room or a cafeteria with six foot tables and brochures and people are walking around and collecting the, the paperwork. That's not, that's not what this is. These are our demo stations, typically about 15 or 20 of the different skilled trades areas. It yep. could be roofing, HVAC, electrical, surveying, concrete, roofing, et cetera, et cetera. There'll be workstations where the, where the kids, uh, they come in, they get a little safety demonstration, they get their goggles, uh, they get their safety vests, they get their uh, hard hats, and then they go around and actually get to touch and in most cases mm -hmm. use the tools. Uh, which is cool because then they, they get exposed to, to what the actual work is. Before we can get these kids into training or into construction management programs, they've got to know that there's an industry and a career path here. And that's what these career fairs are designed to do. So the cool, the, the demo areas are cool, the tools are cool, but the best part of it is they get to meet people in the industry today yeah. who, are, who are skilled, yeah. uh, who are contractors, uh, who are laborers, who are builders, who are managers, and they see, boy, this guy, this gal, this woman, they look successful. They look like they're, they're happy. They look like they're doing all right. I want to be like them. And, and here's mm -hmm. what they do. And, and, and people are happy to talk about, their, about what they do for a living. Um, and the local associations are awesome. They come in and, and support the organization and we feed right. the kids and, and give them presentations. So it's it's been a great uh, effort of ours that we started three years ago. Uh, we kept it going during COVID. We moved a lot of it virtual, which was tough to do. Sure. Um, uh, but we look forward to getting back up to full speed um, as we start the new school year in the fall. And, and if there's any trade, any local home builders associations, uh, we'll be letting loose our next round of grants uh, probably in the fourth quarter of this year. We'll announce those. Uh, so pay attention to your communications from NHB, right, Greg? That's right. That's right. You know, it, it just following up on that a little bit, too. I mean, you know, one of the, the, the areas that we expand is that, you know, we look at correctional institutions for, for labor. We look at vets. You know, veterans are so great for our industry. You know, well-trained, there's a lot of people that are looking toward a second career, seniors. And in really one of the most active areas, and we're making sure that our industry is known as is a home for anybody. The house that she built is our greatest collaboration that, that uh, and Dave, you, you guys are out there, you and Jen, you know, you, you've been covering mm -hmm. that for some time now. It's just yeah. such a great effort to show, uh, uh, you know, talk about that project just for a couple minutes, mostly, and, and you have all your YouTube catalog shows on this. It's so great, but let's talk about that. Yeah, so the house that she built, and you know, that happened in uh, Saratoga Springs, Utah, was all women who came together to build a house. And here's here's from from my perspective, which there's a couple points that I took away that was great. We were on our road show. We took our daughters and our daughters. Oh, we have to go to another job site. Oh, we have to go to another factory. Right. Typical 13 year olds. But when they got there and you drive into a community, right, this is the housing community, like hundreds and hundreds of homes being built. And, and it's a bunch of busy beaver guys everywhere. And then you get to this one job site that looks pristine, it's clean, and it's all <laughs> women doing everything. And the design that they did and how they put it together was so inspiring, so inspiring because, you know, and they were so proud that even our 13 year old daughters, they got hats, they got shirts, they you know, they stayed in connection. It was such an inspiring thing for yeah. them to physically see sure. and experience and be able to talk to other people that are doing it. And this is what we're talking about. This is this live two-way interaction that gets the youth involved. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and it was probably out of all the trips, we went to AutoVol, the automated factory. Eh, it was cool. But this, really? when they went here and saw all the all the women and they flew the plumber in from Pittsburgh. How many of you out there have ever found a female plumber? They're not easy right, to come right. by. No. You're mm. right. But, but they did. And so they pulled this together and COVID hit. They still did it on time. And made and made the uh, showcase of homes they were doing out there, I believe it, right? So, 
it, w- it was an amazing experience. And I think this is all part of the professional wom- women in building. That's right. Which is another organization within NAHB yep. that supports the, that supports this. And out of that show, we've had several people from different parts of the country want to now get involved and start their own PWB. You know, and it's funny because you you always hear when, when I give talks around the country, and now we're traveling again. It's a, it's all right. good, but between professional women in building and our young professional groups, that's the lifeblood. It fits into everything that we talked about today, all these different um, areas. And, and, you know, one of the things, too, you look at where these groups pay particular attention is always the energy Yeah. able yeah. to do with the IECC. We're going to have an ANSI-based standard now to, to – it, it's much better for our industry to build – cost appreciation into some of these energy code requirements and so, so we're we're doing a work a lot of work across the board but you could tell by the comments that we received today and some of the things that they they honed in on that marks talked about we've got a lot of work to do but yet we see that there's a path and there's certainly a growth path and where we can involve a lot of people across the board for sure so let, let's, we got a few minutes left here. I, I want to make sure we cover all the topics. You know, scholarships and funding is something we didn't dive into deeply. You talked a little bit about some of the things. Is there anything that we really want to put out there or, or did we cover where we were at with the, the, the NHE? I can't say that. NHE. It's a little tricky. Funding. It really well, is. I, a, a couple of things. One, I would be remiss to, to ask those that uh, have received great benefit, both personally, um, uh, philosophically, psychologically, and financially from the building industry. Uh, uh, if you want to give back, look at the National Housing Endowment. We're a very efficient organization. Um, we support our own operations through our investments, through our, our corpus. Uh, and, you know, every dollar that comes in from a donor, uh, we send it back out. Um, so right. it, it's not covering our overhead. So we're a very efficient uh, place and we've got uh, a lot of great donors. We've got 30 members uh, of our of our board of trustees. Uh, but beyond that, we manage a number of scholarship funds that I think you're you're talking about, Dave. And these yeah. are specific funds that have been set up by individuals that have done well over their their career in the industry, and they want to give back, but they don't know quite how to do it. And they come to us, and we're right. able to manage the the scholarship process, which is you know promoting the availability. Uh, receiving the applications, putting it online, reviewing the applications, putting together a committee, uh, keeping uh, keeping uh, uh, out of trouble with the IRS, et cetera, et cetera. And we all do that, provide the accounting and the legal framework so that so that people can 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 give money and know it's going to work uh, efficiently and, and all above board. Uh, so check out nationalhousingendowment.org. We manage 14 different scholarship funds right now. Many of these are geographically focused. Uh, some of them are focused on one specific educational institution, uh, and, and and we're glad to do that. Um, but but please take a look at us uh, uh, when you look at your giving. And for those of you that shop on, Am- on Amazon, Amazon Prime Smiles, uh, we're one of the charities you can give to. So you know, a tiny fraction of everything that you spend, Amazon then turns around and, and contributes uh, to the National yeah. Housing Endowment. So so on Amazon Smiles, look up the National Housing Endowment. doesn't cost you a nickel. Real easy way to give back. Yeah. That's a good one, one of the greatest things about the show that we're doing, and, and Mark, what you're, what you're doing, and Greg, what you do as well, and by having you guys come on this show, and if you're, if you're a university out there and you're listening to this or a high school teacher or what have you, Uh, You know, even our platform alone allows people that otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to interact with either one of you. They wouldn't be able to get within 10 feet of you at a trade show. At IBS, you're busy, you're packed. So this provides that two-way engagement. And what we've been learning also, Mark, on the show is when the students get engaged, they start getting job offers because they're talking to the industry leaders and they're all starving for fresh, great minds out there. And so that's a really powerful thing. So I think being more involved with what you guys are doing, Mark, uh, for anybody out there, you're you're a resource to help and find young people and put them in place 
places where they can succeed. And 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 you you're also a resource for knowledge and information for them on how to find these young people. Yes, absolutely. And 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 we're happy to do that. We're happy yeah. to play that role. Uh, you know, we, we write checks every day, but I think some of the most rewarding uh, work that we do are are making connections between uh, future employees and future employers. Perfect. Perfect. You know, just right. Dave, Dave, just real quick too, yeah. just following up on that. One of the things that I think that Mark would be real interesting to hear you just talk real quick about how a lot of these universities now and schools are looking to the content that you've had over time. And there's an overlap because Mark, I'm seeing that there's there's some of these things with the research that you're doing and some of the information that you're pulling together. There's common ground that if we can get these the, some compilation ability where we can share these across the platforms. Yeah. I mean, the, the professors around the country, really, they're using it in their classrooms, right, Dave? They are. They are. In fact, even uh, the study that came out earlier in the year, or maybe it was last year, time's flying. But a lot of universities uh, have asked to use our videos for the research projects, for some of your projects even, because we are bringing on the latest and greatest and trying to promote every, you know, where we're going. So there's a lot of information that we've gathered in, in you know, yeah. from all these professionals, such as yourself, Mark, being on, on the conversation with us. So uh, for sure, there's 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 definitely a two way opportunity to to help each other grow and do things, and I appreciate that, Greg, for sure. Uh, all right, so we're coming up on our time, Greg, but uh, I wanted to I wanted to re go back to you yourself, and you know, let's talk about Greg. What is the American Job Plan? What what is NAHB doing with N A H N H E? All these macronyms are going to tongue tie me today. You know, let's talk about what do you see as the future for for the American Job Plan right now. So, so one of the things that, that we have to keep an eye on really is, um, you know, that our greatest concentration uh, across our membership is small to medium and in some large builders. They, they're, they're our members and they are our um, focus on what we have to do on Capitol Hill. And the reason why I say that is because the current administration has some good ideas about the need for making sure that American families have a place, a roof over their head and, and an affordable house, affordable home. And where we come in is we have to make sure though that to get to that final goal that we're not using only certain types of labor and unionized labor. And yes, there's going to be some look at that because again, we have to really make sure to close the gap and get our workforce developed. We need 350 to 400,000 people in this industry. But as, as a rule, what we do, Dave, is we go up every day and we try to make sure that the American dream is kept alive, that families can afford it. And we believe that the way to do it is make sure that our mom and pops and our, our average members are able to get up, strap the tool belt on, jump in the pickup and get to the job sites and build yep. homes at a price that people can afford. That's where all these things, all these synergies come together. It yep. starts with young people. It starts with training. Uh, you know, as we talked about, doesn't matter what age you are, coming from all different directions, but that's really what we have to do. We have to keep, the, the demand is so built up right now across the country. We could be producing double the units that we are each year, you know, we, we need to produce upwards of a million and a half just to keep pace. And uh, there, there's a lot of places where we can continue to develop and expand our productivity. That's what we have to do. You're right. You're right. The collaboration in our industry coming together, and that's all faucets, that's site builders, stick builders, offsite. We wouldn't be in this position if we had it figured out. We wouldn't be in this position That's if right. we figured out. We, we we would have been ahead of the game and 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 had all the all the people that we needed and wouldn't have lost them to other industries and all of that. So this collaboration of all of us coming together from all angles of the industry and outside of our industry as well yeah. 
is what's going to help us really take our industry to the next level. It has yes. to be cool. It has to be interesting. And Mark, you probably never heard me say this, but you know, when we grew up, there was there were separate sides of the street, right? You were either a burnout, a, a preppy, a sure. skate rat, whatever the case is. And today we still have all of that, but the difference is they all play Fortnite together at night. It doesn't matter what side of the tracks you're on. Oh, they have phones and gaming and all these things in common, which we didn't have. And we sure. need to understand that mentality today because they're more connected today than we ever were. Yeah, certainly. And it's a very, it's a very powerful, powerful thing. Um, Greg, I think this has been great. And, and Mark, uh, I think it's been wonderful having you on. We had one last question. Uh, it's going to cover your face up, Mark. Uh, Andrew Wilkinson wrote a long one. But uh, as we always do, we want to make sure everybody gets their time and their questions up because it's the only opportunity a lot of them get to ever meet you or talk to you. So, Jen, you want to put Andrew's question up. Uh, would you say the economy lost growth due to the pandemic? In turn, business regrouped, ready for the move. Hence, with funding available and materials increase, which allows manufacturers to increase prices until they have hit the predicted output. Developments opened up for employment opportunities from youth experience, tradesmen, etc. Services. Well, that's a whole lot. I got to reread that one. <laughs> so, but would you say the economy lost growth to the to the pandemic? I guess our economy in turn, business regrouped. Of course. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. You know, I, I think one of the things too, Mark, that, that we're seeing is that, you know, at the end of the day, we can't use that now as a crutch, though, because we're seeing no. like in terms of right, the lumber mills now no. are still saying, well, we don't know how long this demand will last. Let's not meet the supply requirements because we're, we just want to protect. So, so instead, the price is what suffers and we're not able to get the supply that we need. Our demand is yeah. inelastic and it's just too great right now. But that's yeah. a great question because where we end up is we have a lot of crutches now because of the pandemic. We've got to break through that and we've got to figure out that, that would, that's where we were. There were a lot of uh, factors that were involved. Now we have to get that in our rear view mirror, put our heads down and plow through it. And if it means that we have some short term solutions that we need and in, in, um, activities in order to push through it, that's what we need to do. Agreed. Mark, you have any you have any parting words for us? Anything that we didn't cover that you feel is super important to get out there to everybody? I Outside think it, of go Habs. You know, uh, <laughs> um, you know, um, talk to your neighbors, talk to your kids, talk to your friends about uh, opportunities in residential construction because they abound. There's a long runway of great careers available. Uh, there's resources available. There's training available. There's great schools available. There's scholarships available. And uh, again, the, the, a, a four-year degree program is great, and uh, but it's not for everybody. And so uh, right. uh, 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 encourage people to take a look at the residential skill trades. There's money to be made and there's great entrepreneurship opportunities. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't have said it better. In my well world, and, and, and I agree 100%, Tesla should be charging our houses. Our houses should not be charging Tesla. And I'll take that up with the man if I, I can ever get him on this show to talk about. <laughs> We, we are the greatest industry out there. We're going to continue to be the greatest industry. We are the industry that brings us out of a lot of financial crises across the globe, as well as our own country. And I think the, uh, I think the American uh, workers are going to do it again. We just need to let them know that our industry is changing. We got cool stuff happening and we got great people like Mark and Greg leading the way and keeping an open mind on how we change what we do and how we do it. But we're still going to build a great product. So appreciate both of you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. All right, Mark, Greg, don't go anywhere. Everybody else out there, please join us Wednesday at one o'clock. We have a manufacturing co company system 3E from Poland that is using a new type of block product that mm -hmm. is not heavy, doesn't burn. And when the building's done, it can absorb right back into the earth. It's environmentally friendly and it is getting a lot of traction, a lot of steam and a lot of investment. So join us at 1 p.m this Wednesday. We'll see you next time. Mark, Greg, stick tight. Bye, everybody.